differently because every marketplace is different. It has its own language. It has its own nuances. It has its own requirements, etc. So one thing that we always advise is when coming into don't look at it as Europe. Look at it as in I'm going to go and sell to Germany. Hey everyone, it's Norm Ferrar, aka The Beard Guy here, and welcome to another Lunch with Norm, the e-commerce and Amazon FBA podcast. Today we're going to be talking about expanding to Amazon Europe, how to identify demand in a new marketplace, what factors should be considered, and what are some of the important do's and don'ts when entering the European market. All right, welcome to another Lunch with Norm the e-commerce and Amazon FBA podcast. Like I mentioned today, we're going to be talking about expanding to the Amazon Europe marketplace. Our guest founded and became CEO of e-commerce nurse and the founder of uh, and CEO of Vendor Society. Her retail career started by building bricks and mortar before moving to Amazon in 2004, where she specialized in vendor management for seven years. With 20 years of experience and 18 years working directly with Amazon, she's, wow, that's that's a good one. She's an expert on strategic coaching, listing optimization, translation, marketing, account management, and PPC management. In short, she speaks Amazon. Okay, today we are going to be welcoming first-time guest Karina McLeod, and that's going to be right after a word from our sponsor. Are you struggling to keep up with your Amazon business? Do you need help from a skilled, reliable virtual assistant? Well, look no further than the Virtual Assistant Academy, or VAA Philippines. Founded by successful Amazon sellers who know the challenges of hiring quality VAs, VAA specializes in locating, screening, training, and supporting high-quality VAs in the Philippines. Their VAs receive extensive Amazon training and ongoing professional development and are committed to a long-term working relationship with you. Partner with VAA and experience the peace of mind knowing that you have a dedicated Amazon-trained VA who's up-to-date with the latest tools and trends in the dynamic Amazon marketplace. Head over to VAAPhilippines.com and let VAA match you with your ideal VA today. Welcome our special guest today. How are you doing? Hey there. Hi, everyone. I'm doing really well. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, lovely introduction as well. It's sort of I feel like I've got certain expectations to live by now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how are you doing, Karina? Yeah, I am doing doing really well. Um, we uh, yep, yeah, I'm obviously coming in from uh from the uk so it's good to hear there are some listeners from um this side of the pond as well there are and one's on right now and there's possibly others on but uh yeah simon is uh one of our loyal uh listeners one of the beardos and he's over there <laughs> and he does a great job i'm um, selling in the uh, uk but um that bad that yep 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 <laughs> <laughs> So I'm curious, um, you've worked with Amazon for 17 years. What were you doing? So I initially, I worked at Amazon in the UK for, it was actually for seven years where I worked as a, an employee. So I worked mm. within the vendor management team and I was based in the UK and, and my role was very much introducing new categories into the UK market. And so I was part of the the launch of a um, uh, home and garden, watches, clothing, sports and fitness, all these new categories that were, well, new at the time. We're talking about, you know, we're going way back. 2004 was when I initially started at Amazon. And so I spent seven years working across and sort of uh, climbing my way up the ladder in vendor management and then um, and then decided to take some time out uh, at the end of 2011 my time out never was really time out because I ended up on the other side uh, consulting for for brands. So, you know, we're now 2023 and I'm still living and breathing Amazon and didn't quite quite escape or escape <laughs> uh, the beast, as it were. <laughs> I Were you in the uh, London office? 
I was actually in the Slough office. So we're talking about before the London office even existed. So the lovely London office that is now there uh, didn't exist in my days. It was Slough when Amazon was really frugal. Um, and for those, if you're in the UK and listening, you'll definitely be smiling by uh, me saying where, where the office was previously in Slough um, compared to London. It definitely wasn't as plush as they have now. Um, so, yes, that's ah. that, those were my days. <laughs> yeah, I, I did have a chance oh, a few years back to speak uh, in uh, Amazon HQ over there in London through um, uh, e, uh, Scale for Retail. Ah, yeah. yes. I always get super jealous when I go into the offices because I'm just like, wow, these are lovely. We did not get these offices at the time. We used to get it where... Um, there would be a, a, a revamp of the office and really it was cutting a hole in the carpet where the coffee stains were and replacing with a circle of a new colored carpet to make it look kind of stylish where, whereas we knew it was kind of a frugal revamp so uh, it definitely uh, Amazon has changed and become so large um, never expected when I started in 2004 would Amazon be the size that it is today. Right. Yeah. Unbelievable. So why don't we start talking about, this is a great topic. I, I want to learn about um, selling in, selling brands in Europe and how can you identify, um, how can you identify the demand in a new brand uh, yeah. in a, a new marketplace? Yeah, this is, this is the ultimate first piece that anybody should do because we often see that uh, we see a number of sellers launching into new marketplaces without even understanding if there's demand and assuming there's demand because there was demand for example for the product in the US and so there's lots of software tools that we use and we advise you know we recommend uh, brands use in such as Helium 10 and other products um, is to understand what are products that you that are similar to your products doing? What are the estimated sales that they're doing to really start getting an idea as to that opportunity? Um, so that's always the first thing that we would recommend doing. Um, but alongside that also, it's just double checking, of course, that you, know, you could see opportunity in a marketplace and think, wow, that product's doing X amount. We could do that as well. You also need to make sure that, that you're not trying to compete with major brands that are very have that brand loyalty uh, with their customers in that country, because that then becomes quite a, a lot harder in order to sort of enter that market. If there's a huge amount of brand loyalty for certain in certain product categories as well. So definitely uh, that's the first step is just understanding those those sales for similar products and understanding what your competitors are doing and. And what brands are in the market? So, and I know it's it's like this over here. Um, I mean, I'm in Canada, but uh, in the states, it's crazy competitive. If there's a brand on there, and it's tough, but it's a huge, it's still a huge market share. Like there's still a lot of sales volume um, that that could uh, that are going through certain keywords for this niche. Would you? Is there a way to compete with these brands? Yeah, as long as you identify your USP, that is vital, um, is really highlighting, OK, what's your point of difference? Why? And really sort of that's where the real competitor research comes in and really understanding, OK, why would a customer want to purchase this product, which is new to market? Brand may not be known. Um, reviews might have carried over from globally. So that that helps. But it's still a, a lesser known brand what would make a customer want to then purchase that product over another? And that's where it becomes really important um, is having that USP, but where really brands need to focus on really optimizing those product pages in, the, in that market. What we often see is sellers sort of just copying everything over, not doing fantastic jobs when it comes to translation and so forth, and, and then sort of expecting all of a sudden a customer to then jump onto their brand, which isn't known compared to all the other brands that already exist in that marketplace. So you've really got to make sure that you are entering that marketplace and doing a, an amazing job 
in everything that you do in terms of translating, localizing and everything and really pulling out what those US USPs are on your on your products. Yeah, some uh, I've been just reading up on a, a little bit of translation recently mm -hmm. with uh, with chat, chat GPT. And <laughs> people are saying it's really fantastic, but you can't rely on it. It's just not a simple way to, oh, okay, I'm going to speak Spanish, Hindi, whatever it is. Uh, and all of a sudden, free uh, translation. I, I know I had a, an experience where we were making these uh, cards and it was for Christmas time for this trucking company. And it, they wanted English, French, and Spanish. And we took care of the French, no problem. We said, well, do you want us to do the Spanish translation? Trans, uh, Spanish translation? Nope, uh, we can take care of that. Okay, well, when the Christmas cards came out, and probably a few days after they went out, we got a panic phone call that uh, the Spanish, which he blamed on us, uh, said, Merry Christmas. Happy new ass. <laughs> yes. I speak Spanish, so I get that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, uh, yeah, after he screamed at us for it, we, you know, just, oh, faxed over the information. Yeah. <laughs> Remember what a fax machine was or is? I do. I do. Definitely. <laughs> Makes <me feel> old. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. But, you know, it, when you take a look at what you were talking about, you know, what, what, what's a little bit different now, I'm going to show mm -hmm. you something. And this is, I'm not sure if Andrew's on, but this is a, uh, just a basketball, uh, that I was reviewing for one of our, um, listeners and, you know, twilight action. Okay. Simple. What is it? Why is it different? Well, first of all, nice glow all the way around, but something that I found very simple. It came with everything and more. It came with a backpack, so you can move it around. It came with an air pump and the insert, which others didn't have all the whole kit. So I didn't have to go and get anything. So there are others out on the marketplace, but they were able to just stand out because of that. And there's a bunch of different products that you see. And there's every day I see products that are just cut and paste from the manufacturer. There's four different people with the same mm -hmm. primary image, same information, and they just don't stand out. And those are the losers. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody can compete with them. So um, anyways, everything that you're doing, that USP, that unique selling, uh, 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 what am I trying to say? Unique selling. Points. There we go. Yay. <laughs> so you know, the USP is so Im um, important that you do something different. And mm -hmm. it might even be as simple as the packaging or, or um, even uh, I talk about this with perceived value. Okay. This is unique. Um, if everybody else is coming out with a shower or, or a shampoo and conditioner and they're the exact same and they don't have a different um, uh, cap or different color or something, Come out with something that mm -hmm. can tell you about shampoo and conditioner. Just change the color on the caps or do something that makes you a little bit different. Um, I don't know what you got to say. I, like that, that is a pet peeve of mine. It's definitely. But the, the thing is often with the photography, you know, it's the same, same product. And it's almost that when you see products that have got the copied photography as well, mm. that, that's, some, that's a frustration because – even if it's a very similar product and looks the same, having a different main image where the photography is shot differently um, make, makes a difference, but also doing doing the photography really well. So it look, gives it that premium vibe uh, and all of that, because what, what often happens is people end up saying, right, OK, they don't focus on the point of difference. They're just going to focus on price. But then you effectively, oh, I'll just drop drop my price and then then we'll get more customers and that's how we'll be known. But almost you're then devaluing your product, right? Because, right. And this is what often happens. So it's about, as you mentioned, that perceived value coming off as a premium brand. You know, it's so interesting that sometimes two products are so similar, but you end up going for one because you've got this perception that it's more premium. It's probably exactly the same, come from exactly the same uh factory 
But because the marketing, they've invested more in the marketing, the photography just looks better quality. The images just in general, the design and everything looks better quality. You end up purchasing the same. And so you can actually get more more margin from that by 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 that perceived value as well. So these orange lights behind me, I did exactly that. I I got suckered and I know I got suckered, but I was okay with it. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is there are these orange lights that I needed for back here. Mm -hmm. I could see the three, four, 10 different types uh, that I could buy and I could buy them really cheap from the same manufacturer you know, or pay more. And it, my mind just kind of clicked. Well, I'm going to pay more. And I mm -hmm. ended up paying more for the same bloody cheap lights. And I guarantee you, I would do that with pet products, beauty yeah. products, all of those products, you know, sometimes going high, uh, you'll notice that you're not going to drop in traffic. You can increase. And I think we got cool hand on. So Luke, uh, I think you just put up your product by substantially more and you found that your traffic and your sales came up and sometimes uh, product cannibalism it, if you're new to Amazon or selling on Amazon, a lot of new sellers come out and they're worried about uh, sales. So what do they do? They go down to the lowest mm. price possible and it's all product cannibalization. And they, people don't realize that a lot of people in the marketplace don't want the, there are people seeking the deals, but there's a lot of people in every niche that want a better quality product. And even if you put it in, Amazon does it. You can have, you know, this nice little gift box or not. They give you the option because they're smart. But uh, I see this all the time where you can easily sell something for $10 or you can sell it for 49 bucks. And really there's that big of a spread. It's crazy. Yeah. And do yeah. you find that in, in the UK as well or over in uh, Europe where uh, I know we can get away with it here, but it, do people look at products the same way there and say, okay, this is the same product, uh, I'll get the lowest one, or are they looking for uh, quality products? Yeah, I mean, there's always a different type of customer, but you are looking for that quality product because, um, you know, customers get, there's this bit of uh, anxious as part of a shopper just worried about what they're getting mm -hmm. on Amazon um, just by sometimes if you get an item with a negative review or there's been sort of, um, you know, gossip going around of are those reviews legit and do they trust the reviews anyway? And so it is this part where customers do want that that premium premium product and we'll, we'll search for that. Um, it's just like I was looking for something the other day. I think it was just I needed to something really exciting, as in I needed to organize everything in the uh, boot or the trunk, the trunk of my car. Um, and all I needed was an organizer. And there were so many and they all looked the same. And I did end up buying the most uh, the more expensive one just because the images looked better quality. The reviews were all always the same. And as I said, Sometimes people are a bit more cautious these days as to how, how much they trust those reviews. Um, but just because they had invested more in the product pages, they had the A plus content, the infographics and all of that, I went with that and paid the premium. Right. Yep. It, it, it's crazy how it works. And you don't have to do anything too crazy to increase the perceived value. But mm -hmm. uh, anyway, that's a whole podcast on a, you know, yeah. by itself. Uh, now let's talk about factors and in what factors should we consider when we're going into or making the decision to get into the right marketplace in UK or EU? Yeah, I think um, you've got to always. So uh, first I mentioned about really understanding if there's demand for the product right. um, in that marketplace, because, you know, we see it. I always use this example, which is a very obvious example. Um sometimes not obvious to everyone but like if you're going to go and you're set selling swimming pool filters in the US and it does really well in the south 
and then you want to then list them and you're not sure what country, then probably selling them to the UK where fewer people have swimming pools in their back gardens or backyards is probably not going to be as much demand. And you might then want to be selling that to Spain or Italy. The reason I give that example is because most of the time when people expand into Europe, they always say, oh, well, we'll go for the largest marketplaces, which are UK and Germany. But that's fine. They are the largest marketplaces if there's demand for your product. So that's the prime example of where a swimming pool filter isn't necessarily going to get as many sales in the UK, even if the market is bigger than a country that is a hotter country like Spain, which is a smaller market, but there's going to be more demand for that product. So it's making sure that you're evaluating. And as I said, using tools to, to, really, to really understand that. Another thing to also take into account is some products are prohibited and some products um, categories are restricted in different countries. So it's just doing your homework there as well, because last thing is that you want a product. We had it where it was actually Europe to the US where there was a, we had a client selling confectionery, um, selling uh, uh, alcoholic gummies. Um, but of course, you can sell that in the UK, but you can't sell that in the US. So it's completely some things that might you might think are obvious for sale in your country aren't necessarily the same. So it's it's definitely doing all of all of that. Um, you know, we talked about USP. One one interesting part also is on the branding piece, right? You've got you may have uh, you've created this brand in the US, let's say. One thing that's really important, if you're then entering into Europe, there's two things, double checking the trademark, double checking that that trademark has not been used, it's not been registered with somebody else. Because if you bring this brand in and it's already the trademark is not with yourselves, there's obviously going to be some some trouble there. Um, so you want to make sure that that trademark hasn't been um, registered with another company and getting that trademark. Another thing is also understanding, and, and it's a bit different when we're talking about the UK market. If we start going into markets like the German market, French, France, Italy, et cetera, it's just making sure that you're very aware of what your brand means in those countries, because sometimes it might not mean what you want it to mean um, in that country. And I'll give, I know an example was where um, it's an old example. I always give it because it always makes me smile. And it plus it was my first car. I used to drive a Vauxhall Nova, um, which it was uh, was my first car. And that and I can never understand why that car didn't exist in in Spain. But actually, the brand was called Opel. It wasn't called Vauxhall, as in the car car manufacturer name. And it wasn't Nova. It was Corsa. And the reason because of Nova means doesn't go. So they couldn't sell that car. So they had a different name of what the branding and the uh, model was in the UK compared to Spain, because otherwise they're not going to sell a car that you say doesn't go. And so that always um that always sticks with me in my mind. And it seems sometimes so obvious, but you see so many brands get that wrong. So it's doing that sort of homework as well, because you might think it's quite easy to just jump into a country with the brand that you've already got, but not if it means something else or could be something offensive as well. So you never quite know. <laughs> yeah, I, I know I was uh, uh, doing a, a talk, my first talk, my first public talk on perceived value, first time on stage. And I was doing this um, research, and I, I, this is true, by the way. This is like lost in translation. <laughs> so there was Mr. Noodle. Uh, you know, I think you have Mr. Noodle over in, in UK. It's just ramen noodles, right? Well, somebody else came out with a version that they were trying to sell in North America, um, but they lost it in translation. It was uh, soup for sluts. <laughs> I am not kidding. Oh my goodness. I am not kidding. So uh yeah, just you know, Google Translate. And then the other, this is a car. So I used to live in Kona, Hawaii. And when the Kona car came out from uh Hyundai, I thought, oh, that's kind of cool, you know, brings back memories. Until I found out in Portuguese, um the uh what Kona means is the uh, women's private parts. And so oh, they had to change yeah. it in Portugal to Kauai. So it's the Hyundai Kauai. So even these big brands make mistakes. Completely. That is a prime, <laughs> prime example. And something that's so, it, 
only takes like five minutes to figure that out as well. Yet the repercussions of that are so costly and so timely in everything. Um, whereas, yeah, it's just a quick check on Google Translate. Does my brand mean something else in that country? <laughs> <laughs> and making sure you keep the accents on as well. Like, oh, uh... <laughs> yeah, because that changes things too. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh. So um, it's the bottom of the hour. Uh, and I just want to remind you that if you have any questions or comments, um, please uh, let us know. We do have a cutoff today uh, in the next 15 minutes. So we will be answering any questions, going over some comments. Uh, we do have a giveaway. And um, Kelsey, why don't you tell us what the giveaway is today? All right, so we're gonna do a social media audit uh, from me. So uh, if you are interested in getting your brand, uh, having me check over any uh, of your social media platforms, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, um, those would be the three, or YouTube too. Um, just uh, enter the Wheel of Kelsey, that's comment hashtag Wheel of Kelsey in the comment sections. If you take two people, you can, uh, get an extra entry and uh, we're going to be spinning and seeing who the winner is at the end of this. So if you're looking to ramp up your video or your social media, uh, just uh, enter today's giveaway and uh, I'm going to be yeah doing a 30 minute to an hour consultation, whatever it takes, and we can go over um, content strategies. And I've done a couple with uh, oh. Luke and some of the yeah. other Beardos here. So um, yeah, looking forward to see who, uh, who I get to hang out with, and uh, yeah. All right. Well, very good. My dog just brought me uh, my slippers. Very good. Very good. He's a very loyal dog. Uh, one day he brought me a raw egg. He kept it in his mouth. He brought it during the podcast. But uh, anyways, he's just a goof. Anyways, oh, oh he's that. gone. There he goes, taking it somewhere. <laughs> so, Kels, let's go over to um, a sponsor. Then we'll come back, and we'll get into the uh bottom oh tony sagar is here hi tony all the way from bali okay so let's go to a sponsor i want to give a quick shout out to an incredible group of sponsors who help keep our podcast running the lunch with norm podcast wouldn't be possible without the support of the following sponsors wally smarter post purchase pro vaa philippines jeff schick law rebate Honu Worldwide, Extreme Power, Dragonfish Brand Management, and Startup Club. Thank you. And now back to our show. Okay, so just a couple more questions and we'll get into uh, Simon's question here or anybody else that wants any questions. But the steps involved. Let's Can, can you just kind of walk us through what we need to do to get into these uh, new marketplaces? Yeah, sure. So... We talked about understanding demand, <coughs> excuse me. Once you've been able to identify that demand, you then want to make sure, excuse me, um, the legal requirements. It's understanding that your product is compliant. I haven't coughed at all until you asked me that question. And then it's like, what do you need to actually get into uh, Europe? And then all of a sudden uh, I get a frog in my throat. <laughs> Nothing to do with entering Europe. Um, so we talked about product compliance. It's just making sure that understanding what are the packaging requirements, the um, labeling requirements for your products, um, because in certain products like electronics, toys, there's certain requirements like CE marking that you need. There's certain EU legislations that you need if you've got products containing batteries. So we always say seek legal advice. Um, there are companies out there that know exactly what each cat that work with sellers from from Amazon and can give you that guidance in terms of what you need to make sure you have on your packaging, on your labels, what uh, any other things that you need to be aware of if you are sending that product into the UK. Understanding your tax ob obligations. So, Norm, when you started, I know that I heard the word VAT. So, um, yes, of course, understanding what those obligations are, depending on the marketplaces that you look to to enter, is another one. I mentioned about registering your trademark. Make sure you do that as soon as, because that takes some some time. Um, 
there are lots of shipping companies out there that are so experienced with selling products, um, sent shipping products from the US over to Europe, direct from China, depending on wherever you, you manufacture your product, um, appoint those shipping companies. Ideally, you get a shipping company that can manage all the customs as well, because that's something you just don't want to want to have to get into. But also they can then help you understand those costs, because it's really important that you understand the costs involved, um, because sometimes you might not know all those um, might not do that calculation at the start of all the different fees and then find out that you're not going to make much money by the time the product is uh, actually selling on Amazon. So it's really understanding that with your shipping company. Um, taking into account, you're going to have that currency exchange as well. There's going to be some loss. There's going to be some gains. There's some payment providers out there that can help you if you are converting, make that conversion, uh, the cost and the fees involved. Uh, drop that down a few percentage points as well. Um, think about how you're going to manage customer service and returns. There's companies out there that can do that for you. And of course, finding out a 3PL logistics provider and, you know, are you going to go FBA? Do you want to sell to all marketplaces? Do you want to just sell in one? Those are all the sort of next steps that you need to think out, think about more the, the operations part. Okay. So there is, there is, uh, <laughs> you know, you have to think about it, you know, you can't just jump into it. And uh, is it possible to do it yourself? Or should you be looking for an agency to help you out and work through this? Um, you know, I would definitely say seek, uh, seek support on this. And um, because we see so many sellers trying to do this um, at low cost. And I think the reality of it is it does require an investment if you want to get the results that bring you that return to make it worthwhile. Um, so I would definitely say try to avoid those shortcuts because it may seem like a low cost option. But if you end up like avoiding somebody supporting you with the compliance part, and then you end up with a delisted product or, you know, your product stuck at customs, et cetera. Those become a lot more costly. So it may seem like an initial cost at the start, getting that kind of uh, guidance. But it's mm -hmm. definitely better to pay up that up front than find out further down the line that your product um, doesn't have certain um, doesn't hit certain labeling requirements, for example, et cetera. When it comes to um, and that's the operational part, when it comes to actually the part of selling on Amazon, that's often the part that, again, businesses assume is pretty, pretty easy, been able to sell in the US. I can almost take that strategy from the US, do the same in the UK or let's say in German market. It's not necessarily the same. And this is where we always say treat every marketplace within Europe differently because every marketplace is different. It has its own language. It has its own nuances. It has its own requirements, et cetera. So one thing that we always advise is when coming into don't look at it as Europe, look at it as in I'm going to go and sell to Germany or I'm going to sell to the UK because otherwise there's a lot to do just in one marketplace than all marketplaces and you want to get it right. So it's best to do it, do it gradually. And that's when it comes to an agency that can help you with the translation. And it's really important where I say about helping you with translation is many companies want to, or sellers want to do that alone. And you may be able to find a freelance translator that can do that for you. If you do do that, always make sure that your translation is localized for that market. And what I mean by that is it talks to the native audience. They do the keyword research for you because keywords get lost in translation. And in some countries, one product can mean so many different things compared to another country. And there might be different ways of expressing it in different types of keywords that just can't be translated. So definitely our advice would be to seek those specialists. Um, but of course, you need to be prepared that, that that does come at a cost. You know, even just talking about localization, I think it's so important. So I live in rural Canada. Uh, Kelsey lives in the city, in Toronto. Completely different audience. But even further, and this has got to be the same way in Europe, if I go five hours from here and I go to Montreal, it's a completely different person. 
and just like a bit more chic, a bit more. And there's just everything about it is culturally different than where I live right now, where I have more cows than humans, <laughs> you know, and and where, you know, even considering where Kelsey lives in Toronto, which is a bit more, a lot more conservative when you go a few hours, you know, to, uh, to Montreal. So imagine that on a much wider scale, when you're talking about countries going from Germany to France, to the UK, I, I know when, uh, whenever I speak, if, if I speak in Europe, but UK is a totally different audience than if I'm in Australia, than if I'm over here, you know, completely different. And um, you have to look at it that way too, when you're selling your products. Now, I, I guess the other thing uh, I wanted to talk to you about are a bit of the do's and the don'ts, and then we'll get into a couple of questions. Yeah, do. Um, so let's start with the, with the, with the don'ts and ends with the do's then. The don't, don't assume, let's, if we say we're going to the UK marketplace, because this is often what many US sellers will do because it's the same language. Um, again, the localization part, don't assume just because you're going into the UK that it, it, we speak the same language. We do speak English, but we also use, there's many a different words to describe things. Um, and so the language is slightly different from, you know, um, American English to British English. The same comes from uh, Latin American Spanish to um, Castilian Spanish as well. So just one one thing there. I think also don't assume that um, a machine translation will suffice because would you buy a product with really bad grammar and typos that doesn't isn't really make much sense and it's not really coherent in the US. Chances are no. Probably so why not. would the same happen with Germany? And I think that sometimes that we forget because we if we don't speak that language, we assume it will be okay. It isn't okay. And if you aren't getting many sales, that's probably why because you do need to invest in good good copy. Um, and the other thing is. Um, you know, I've sort of said about not entering all European marketplaces at once. We do get that where it's we just want to go into Europe. Um, we always advise step by step. You can have a staggered approach. You know, overall, your goal might be Europe. Doesn't mean you have to do it all at once. You can just do it in, in stages. In terms of do's, as I mentioned earlier, do your homework, do your research before you enter that marketplace. Make sure there is demand. Make sure your product um, isn't restricted, for example, and make sure you understand all the compliance and the legal obligations and the costs as well to make sure that you're going to sell a product that's actually going to make money in that marketplace as well. Um, invest, as I've been keep saying, invest in really good uh, translations and copy. And when I say translations and copy, we're not just talking about the bullet points and description, talking about content on the text on graphics on your A plus pages, your product images, your infographics. If your brand registered in Europe, m many brands now have access to upload localized images, product images. Now we're talking about video content, making sure that your video content is also um, in that uh, the audio is in that language. So all those tiny little things do make do make a difference as well um, and helps you sort of really get that br that brand loyalty that customer loyalty because they can see that you've invested and in, into um, into that marketplace um, and lastly I would say is um, well, I've just really touched on that is doing your maths um, and just really understanding that that cost as well yeah these are all great points and I know that I'm just looking at the clock. You've got to get out of here in a minute, don't you? Yeah, no, I have time for time for questions because I know it's always important. If you've got a question, you want it answered. <laughs> okay, well, we have a few questions. Kelsey, can we start on them, please? Okay, yeah. So the first one is from Simon. Uh, Amazon and Europe uh, do not make deliveries into FBA from UK. Uh, easy to do to and the Brexit <laughs> rules around VAT and duties. What is the best way to stock from UK to FBA EU? Um, well, they have a they really you're going to have to find most brands that we deal with. If you're trying to do FBA, best way to ship stock from um, 
UK to F to Europe is many businesses will have two places. Um, and we're, we're typically finding that brands will have a setup where they send stock and have stock in the UK. And then they'll have stock. Usually they often pick the German marketplace or actually Netherlands as well. Um, although some businesses are now doing France because they're saying that it ends up being cheaper. So it's just having one, uh, finding one location within mainland Europe. And then you can play on the, um, the uh, EFN. Um, because then Amazon can use inventory from that one location within that one country within Europe. And that's better from a tax obligation, although I'm not going to go down the tax route because I'm not, not an advisor and don't want to sort of cre create any um, any uh, incorrect false information. But usually we say pick one country within mainland Europe and then you have to also work with the UK. And it's almost treat it, treat it as a uh, set, completely separate. I hope that answers that question. Okay. Sounds and good then, to me. And <laughs> then uh, we got a comment and another question. So uh, we'll do the question first. Uh, are the VAT services that Amazon offers any good? Or should we look for alternative services providers such as like Avask, uh, Avalara, et cetera? Most sellers that we use will use an external company, Avask, Avalara. I mean, they've all got, they've all worked typically with Amazon anyway. So there's so many VAT uh, providers out there that work with Amazon that really understand uh, everything that you need. Um, I often go with, with those because you get the, uh, the, the true information as opposed to sometimes Amazon, you know, um, just as a, you've got Amazon global services. They obviously want you to expand into many, as many countries as possible and may make it sound a lot more, um, sometimes a bit easier than it is. So sometimes right. it's good to go to the actual third party providers. Yeah. And we've, we've had a VASC on the uh, podcast before and, uh, I've met up uh, with just I met up with a Vask at a wedding a couple of weeks back. Oh, wow. anyway, yeah, yeah. So, uh, anyways, um, I know they're they're awesome at what they do. And if anybody needs yeah. any information, just let us know, and we'll get you pointed in the right direction. Okay, and just a final comment from Tony. Uh, I was going to list the leather aprons in Europe with Germany being the best option, but upfront and ongoing charges with not enough of a potential return. Uh, I decided against it. Uh, doing your homework. That's that's great, Tony. Yeah. Yeah, completely. I think that goes back, yeah, like to what we were saying is actually identifying is there demand, but also understanding the costs um, because sometimes it, it doesn't uh, make financial sense. And especially if you're shipping stock initially from the US, um, because sometimes if you've got to ship it direct from China, it means sending in huge more quantities and if you don't understand the demand it you know it's not always uh viable right okay i think that's you are off the hook karina hey thank you for coming on i i, I it's too bad that you have to go right away i always like talking a bit afterwards but uh i hope we can talk fairly soon and uh get you back on you are awesome Awesome. No, thank you so much. It's been a, uh, it's been a pleasure, Norm. I'm, I'm really, uh, it's been lovely to meet you and thank you everyone for listening and it would be awesome to come back on. So thank you. You're very welcome. All right. Now you can catch your call. So Hi, thank you. <laughs> Karina, Take care, um, everyone. just uh, if you, do you have any uh, links oh, yes. or services that you'd like to um, share? Oh, with of course. Yeah. Contact? So if um, so, e-commerce nurse, we're an Amazon focused agency. So we uh, support brands um, uh, in, in Europe and we cover North America as well. Um, we support brands in from account management, uh, PPC management, all the way to um, marketing support. Um, we do the photography here in the UK. We do design um, and, and everything as well as consulting. Um, we work with brands, as I say, established brands all the way to startups and we cover off, uh, we work with vendors and we work with sellers as well. So if you're looking for any support or you're looking to expand, um, you might be from the US looking to expand into Europe. We work with a lot of partners as well that support us that can cover the product compliance part, the legal aspect that cover off the, the shipping part as well. If you're interested, just reach out to us. Our email is hello at ecommercenurse.com. 
And you can also send us a contact us form if you just go to our website at ecommercenurse.com, contact us. And if you reach out to us, um, someone in the team will get back to you. Okay. And I learned what a boot was today. Yes. It's, it's not just me saying about, because most people make fun of me saying about, it was a, a boot. <laughs> it's a boot, yeah. The car boot. A trunk. Yeah. There we go. Learning trunk. things all the time. All right, Karina. Well, thanks a lot for coming on board. And we're going to go over the Wheel of Kelsey in two seconds. Awesome. Thank you, Norm. And thank you, Kelsey. And thank you, everyone. Have a good one. You too. Okay. So we're going to go over to the Wheel of Kelsey. If you're just uh, tuning in, we had to cut it short today. I think we got everything uh, covered. Uh, Karina was great. But if you want to enter, it's hashtag Wheel of Kelsey. Tag two people and you'll get a second entry. We'll run a commercial, then we'll go right over. So this is your last chance. What the heck is a bonnet? Is a, is a bonnet a truck or a trunk too? Or what's he talking I, I about? Don't think so. Simon, Simon, he always throws curveballs. Anyways, hashtag Wheel of Kelsey. Tag two people. You'll get entered into the draw today. Launching products isn't like it used to be. To successfully launch your product, you need to hit that algorithm from all sides. Driving external sales, boosting social signals, and increasing product listing engagement are fundamental to success. Rebate is the first and only launch platform that delivers across this broad range. Get your product featured on Amazon.Live through Rebate's Influencer Program. With this service, your product gets instant exposure to large audiences of shoppers and permanent placement on Amazon Influencer Storefront, which drives perpetual sales. Run a sweepstakes campaign on Rebate and connect with shoppers off Amazon. And lastly, drive external sales with tried and true deals campaigns. Visit rebate.com today and get started with your 14 day free trial. All right, that's it. Why don't we go over to the wheel? All right, here we go. It's time for the Wheel of Health. Right. All so right. today we're doing a giveaway for my own social media audit. So uh, thank you everyone who entered today's giveaway. And I'm going to shuffle these up and let's see who the winner is. So we do this every single podcast. So make sure you come back and enter again on Wednesday. And it looks Tony. like Tony, Tony is the winner. Yeah. Perfect. Tony, if you can just email me, k at lunchdorm.com. Congratulations. And uh, yeah, I'll be talking to you shortly. All right. Well, I guess that's it. Anything else we have to cover, Kels? Uh, other than just making sure you smash those like buttons, give us a thumbs up. Um, if you have any topics uh, for future episodes, just let me know, k at lunchwithnorm.com, or you can post away in the Facebook group. Uh, the Facebook group is called Lunch with Norm, Amazon FBA and e-commerce collective. So just uh, check it out. Um, it's got a great community there. So if you have any questions um, about selling on Amazon or e-com, um, it's a great place to be. And uh, I think that's it. All right. Perfect. Well, join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at noon Eastern Standard Time. And thank you. Want more great information? Don't forget to subscribe by clicking here. Also, if you want to check out our latest podcast, click over here. Lunch with the, lunch with the, lunch with the.